Because, I mean, if you get gain when you're recording it, you can't remove the gain later. You know what I mean? Just put on loads of distortion. Yeah, exactly. Real metal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, mine's recording. Clap. One, two, no. Oh. We have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. One, two, three. How are your notes doing? Good, yeah. You're correct. I'm just ready to go. Oh, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so, folks, today I am not alone in the recording studio. There, there's someone in the room, and we are talking about the spookiest of spookies, and that is the vampire. Now, there's one story we are going to focus on today, but, 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 you know, before we do, let's talk about some real-life vampires for a second. Let's talk about some of, some of the more famous cases. Uh, by the way, my guest for today, Keith, uh, the folks at home. Oh no, that Keith has long hair, and he's got tattoos, and he's kind of vampiric looking. You're pale. I think that was a compliment. Yeah, yeah very exactly. Much. You kind of look like Rod Furl, actually. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, you know, that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> right, so like, when I started looking up about the vampires, I was like, there can't be that many real vampires out there. Man, there are so many. Is there? Yeah, just like ton of them, or like we have like all right. So some of them I was looking up, and well, we have the OG vampire. Are these wait? Are these like fucking insane people, or are these actual people who thought they were vampires? Like, or are these just like idiots? So it kind of went back to the very start. Okay. Of like the OG vampire, like which is, of course is Jesus Bram Stoker. Christ. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that man's the OG. Oh yeah, he did come back from the dead and turn uh, wine into blood and drank it all. He turned wine into his own blood. Yeah. Gave it to his friends. Exactly. And then he f- turned all them into vampires. Back to like uh, Vlad the Impaler then. So he was he was he was he was the, he was the original. Right? But he didn't like you're just fucking making this shit up. He didn't actually think he was a vampire though. He was just a sick son of a bitch. He, he just like fucking sticking his pole in other men's butts. That's pretty much all he liked to do. That is true. I do have, like, a problem with the name. Vlad the Impaler? Yeah. Could any man who has sex with a woman really be called an Impaler? I suppose, like, it depends on the length. You know, it depends on, depends on your manhood. If you're going to tell a woman you're going Impaler, she's like, that's high <laughs> yeah, expectations. It is, you know? She's <laughs> pretty high, actually, there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right, she's ready, and then it's like, all right, I'm going to whip out my whole tree inches for you. <laughs> <laughs> Severely let down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My bad. I know. He impaled, apparently, like, 20,000 women men and children but it's not a chance he did all himself it's maybe awesome. he did them all in a row maybe he got one really really long stick and like like shish kebab, shish kebab. yeah exactly every person on the same thing like human centipede so like human pineapple human so mm-hmm. like i'm sure he got people to do it so I'm it's sure more he, it's yeah. less vladdy impaler more like vlad the delegator jim bob down the road he's the real impaler yeah dude, you know I, what I mean? I'm like it's still yeah. it's like to motivate someone to impale a child like that's still very impressive it is. They were sick bastards, though, back in medieval times, so they were, like, mad to do sick shit, I think. They probably, he probably didn't even want him to do it. He's like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And they were like, too late. Yeah, dude. No TV, no podcast. Yeah, I think we ever had one of those sun flares knocks F and out, we're going straight back. I know, I can't wait. Yeah. I'm fucking over it. I've been looping up a pole all day. Getting to present times then. So, like, real okay. vampires. So there was one in, like, uh, this guy, Lyle. Lyle. Lyle, Lyle the Vampire? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great name. Oh, Lyle. Lyle oh, hey guys, I'm Lyle. Yeah, and he broke into a woman's home and in Texas, and he claimed to be a 500-year-old vampire. When was this? This was 2011. Wow. Yeah, so not, not too long ago. So he broke into a woman's home, and uh, but he didn't kill her, though. He just bit her. Oh. So, yeah, so, not a huge story there. No, he's not really much of a vampire if he didn't kill her either. That is true, that is true. Mm-hmm. And then we have, uh, I guess, older ones then, uh, Richard Chase. Vampire of Sacramento. Vampire of Sacramento. Heavy yeah. hitter. Yeah. Heavy Big hitter. guy. Man, did you ever see fucking pictures of him? He's an ugly motherfucker. His uh, teeth are fucked. Yeah, and very, like, smelly as fuck. Really? Yeah, oh, just wow. sort of, like, the, the, the smell this, alone. Dude. Just fuck like him. him. Yeah, yeah. Vampires are supposed to be, like, charismatic and, like, pretty fucking chill-ass dudes. This is something yeah. I'm kind of coming to, le- like, as I was kind of going through and I learned about, like, these other vampires, there's, like, another one there, uh, Joshua Rudiger, self-proclaimed vampire. He said he was two, he told police he was 2,000 years old. Mm. And so, like, along with him, and then awesome. also, like, uh, Rod, Rod Farrell. Rod Farrell, yes. These are not, like, these, these are not what you expect from a typical vampire. They haven't got, they're not that suave. So. No. Well, this thing, I mean, there could be real vampires out there, but... How are we supposed to know? It's not these guys. It's only the fucking idiots who get caught, as always. Yeah. So, you know, it's like the best thieves, the best killers. You know, you, nobody knows who... It's probably like the, the best serial killer who ever lived. No one knows his name, because he did, was good at his job. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Doesn't leave yeah. a trace. No, that's it. In and out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's your, that's your research done. 
Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Great. Hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole podcast, um, well, see, I have actually this whole introduction paragraph for you, but I've already, you've already started talking and introducing you, so, I mean, wait, I haven't even said your name yet, I don't think. Don't tell people. Okay, we'll just see, we'll go to call you Mr. K. I'll be, I'll be a, a mystery. Well, I let me think of the, of the people at home. Like, if I wanted to promote you, Keith, you're, I'm introducing you now. You know, in typical podcast rules, you're only supposed to start speaking after I say your name. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll start again. So, you know, the folks at home, what would they know you from? Why don't you promote yourself, like, a little? What, what would they be familiar with you from? Okay, so my name is Keith, and you would know me from absolutely nothing. I have zero web presence, barely have a Facebook page, mm. and uh, that is it. I'm not really it. It's not a lot of it. Not really luck going on in my life. Well, folks, let me tell you a little bit about Keith. Let me tell you something over here. Uh, Keith is a good friend of mine, maybe even the best, and he enjoys sick shit, don't you, you fucking psychopath? Oh, I do. Yeah, he does. he's mad for it. Mad. Speak more on this. What kind of sick shit do you enjoy? Folks are, folks from listening are curious. Tell, unleash your darkest desires. Oh, right just now, like, podcast. Just like really, Please really, listen. just real dark stuff, like, you yeah. know, like, Putting people down. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Being mean. Yeah, knocking our conflicts over. Exactly. Just, Leaving real, doors open, real, not indicating. Yeah, real nasty. Well, I'm, I'm not that bad. You know? I'm not mm-hmm. a BMW driver, but... What a great story. Keith's joining me today. Uh, as myself, oh, like myself, he's interested in murder, crime mm-hmm. stories, horror mm-hmm. stories. You like all true crime. You like spooky things. Keith, what's the scariest thing to ever happen to you? Other than uh, being on this podcast. Ooh. That is a good one. Oh, I have a good one. So you do? Say, yeah. Oh. So I'd say, right. like, it, folks. the, um, have you ever had sleep paralysis? I have not. Oh, yeah. No, I've had sleep paralysis a couple of times now. I kind of start getting it in college. Um, and I still remember my very first one. It yeah. Was, I, was, I was in bed and I kind of, I woke up and I couldn't move. The usual sleep paralysis stuff. Yeah. Paralyzed. Yeah. Oh. And then heard, like, scraping on the door and children crying outside really yeah and then the door opening and then like a shadowy figure co- coming in wait this are you serious like you're just lying in your dark room and you start hearing this shit like yeah yeah no like a loud as you know oh, reality that, that essentially very real. like, like it, that, yeah yeah th- this was like my first experience of it mm-hmm. and yeah i hadn't got a clue what's happening i thought it was very very real yeah what was happening and do you think you were like losing your mind do you think you were going insane I, I, I didn't have too much time to think about it because it was it was very scary in the moment. Like, yeah. it was just kind of, you know, survive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're here, like, fight or flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, you yeah. can't actually do anything. Can't so. do anything. You're, <laughs> you're, you're just stuck there. It's like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then... That was, suck this up. One, there was one year, it was where I got it over the course of a year, maybe, like, five or six times within the year. And I remember that year, it was, like, I was drinking quite a lot that that year. Ah, we're, 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 very we're nice. Quite a bit. Tell us, tell us more about that. Tell us that you're drinking quite a lot. Tell us, tell us more about this. We were going to the pub maybe yeah. twice. You were in college at the time. Um, this is actually after college. Ah, after college. you so were we, so you were drinking while you were working. Drinking while I was working. Oh, only mm. have to be drinking on the job. Only have to be. Tell us more. Well, who's your boss at the time? What's his phone number? How you call him? <laughs> <I> call him. <laughs> okay. <I'm done>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we were drinking quite heavily at the time, and uh, most mostly the weekends. And because you're drinking heavily, you're not sleeping well. So I had quite a bit of sleep paralysis that time, um, which I kind of jogged, I kind of jotted up to not sleeping very well. Yeah. And but then um, we had our daughter was born, yeah. and I kind of obviously stopped drinking as much. Yeah. And then, but. I've never slept as little in my life. Ah, I never got sl- wish for some. I, I, I never got sleep paralysis. Yeah. So it only comes when I drink heavily. Ah. So these ghosts are taking advantage of me. So we already spoke on this. We already brushed upon the topic of vampires. But do you like vampires, Keith? You think they're pretty cool? I think they're pretty cool. Yeah, man. Vampires are the best. Mm. I think of all the monsters, I think vampires are the coolest. We're going to Florida for this story. It's um, yes. it's the city of Eustis, if you can believe that. Eustis. It sits on Lake Eustis. Uh, in central Florida, 45 minutes north of Orlando. And living there today is just a little bitty more than 20,000 people. But we're going back to the 90s. 90s are, like, definitely my favorite decade. You got, like, all the spooky shit. All of us horror was made in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And this is, like, part of that. You had X-Files, Goosebumps, uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? All that good shit. So back then, there was less than 15,000 people li- uh, living in Eustis. Now, there's a pretty cool graveyard in Eustis, uh, a cemetery, Greenwood Cemetery. What's the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery? I could Google it, I, but I, 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 would, not, I would feel a cemetery is older. Yeah. But when does a graveyard become a cemetery? I don't care enough to even open this up. I'm sorry. 
Let's begin with the tale of Rod Farrell, right? You ready? Are you ready for this? Yeah. Rod Farrell, he was, what are you looking at, by the way? You're looking at your computer and I'm like wondering what, is there more notes there? I, I loads it. You loads it? Holy fuck, Keith. Yeah. You really did do preparation yeah, for this. I did, dude. I, I am. Take it very seriously. Yeah. I thought you'd take this as seriously as I would have taken it, as I clearly am taking it right now. <laughs> um, all right. Okay, great. Great. No, this is good. Okay, I'll tell you the story and you can share your notes with me whenever the moment arises. Okay, okay. Uh, look forward to that, folks. So Rod Farrell, he was born in the town of Murray, Kentucky, population about the same as you, as 15,000 people, mm-hmm. and he was born in the spring of 1980. He was a March baby. He was an only child to two parents who were teenagers themselves. His dad, named Rick, was soon, um, they married, his parents married, but his dad was soon pretty much out of there. He went off to join the military and never interacted with his son again. So his mother, 18-year-old Sandra Gibson would move himself and herself in with her parents. She would ask her parents to help raise her 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 son. And so they would uh, live on and off with her parents for years. Uh, and Sandra, for work, she worked as an exotic dancer. Nice. An occasional sex worker. Also very nice. Very nice. So, sounds pretty good to me so far. Honestly, pretty sweet childhood for old Rod, having a moving in and out with his grandparents, mother as a sex worker. Could have been worse. Could have been worse. Could, Could have been, been better. Could have been better. <laughs> yes, maybe. Question mark. Possibly. I don't know. We'll, uh, you know, we'll let's, leave it to that. Let, let's see what this pounds out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's see, let's see where it goes. I hope, I hope it's let's, a happy ending. Yeah, exactly. Let's see where it goes from there. So Sandra Gibson, right? She herself, obviously, she had Rod at 18, so she was a pretty young mother, and as a young'un, uh, as a young baba, she dabbled, she, you know, fiddled around with it a bit, stuck the baby toe in, maybe impaled herself on vampirism. Mm. Vampirism, the dark powers. Ooh, fascinated dark arts. Yes, indeed. She was fascinated by the occult. Fascinated by it. Mad about it. She just fucking loved it. And so she passed this on to her son. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a good time for vampire movies though, in the 90s. It was pretty good. I mean, you got Interview the Vampire, Blade, Blade 2. Dracula. It's a vampire in Brooklyn. So Sandra, she liked the occult. She liked the Ouija boards, all that kind of shit. But then she kind of tried to do some not cool shit when in 1997, when she herself was 35 mm-hmm. years of age, she got into some dark arts when she tried to sleep with a 14-year-old boy. The saddest part about this is she tried. She tried. Yeah, that's the thing. She didn't even <laughs> succeed. It's a 35 year old woman yeah. trying to sleep with a 14 year old boy. Didn't do it. God damn. That is actually like, kind of good. But also, yeah, it is a good thing it didn't work. But at the same time, it's like pathetic. Can't even woo a 14 year old boy. You were like, it's like the horniest moment of your life and you still wouldn't have sex with her. <laughs> she would plead guilty to that. She would get probation for that. Um, but she, so she was trying to have sex with him as part of the vampire, vampire. ritual. The vampire. A uh, ritual called crossing over. Okay. Now, Keith, do you know what crossing over is? When you suck each other off? Yeah, that's yeah. it, exactly. You nailed it in one, really. So, Rod, uh, this is the kind of shit he, he kind of grew up with, just mm-hmm. believing generally mad shit. Uh, not exactly. I mean, his mother was a pedophile. Yeah. Uh, so, kind of, kind of fucked. Even this is a letter she wrote to her 14-year-old boy, and it goes a little something like this. Exactly like this. I long to be near you for your embrace. Yes, to become a vampire, a part of the family, immortal and truly yours forever. I only hope that one day you will once again return to Murray. You will then come to me and cross me over, and I will be your bride for eternity, and you my sire. It's good, I like it, it's romantic. Can you imagine he just got that letter and was like, fuck that bitch, and just like burned it or threw it away immediately? So Sandra's parents, you know, who helped raise her and Rod, uh, they would buy a house in Eustis, which was how they'd come from Murray, Kentucky, to Eustis, Florida, which is where I began the story. And there, Sandra, she began seeing a man, and so they would travel between the two, between Kentucky and Florida, over time. Uh, and it was in Eustis, that hot rod over here, a loner, dressed in black, looking like a school shooter, which means looking pretty cool. Uh, he met a girl there named Heather Wendorf. And that is when the real trouble began. So Heather herself, she was a daughter of Naomi, a school volunteer, and Richard, a warehouse manager. She had an older sister, two years older than her, named Jennifer. Now Heather, a bit of a rebellious spirit. Hmm. What do you think about that? I don't know. I don't know. Don't like rebellious spirits now. I guess like... Like from what I've from what I've read about it, like it's been like really like lame rebellious stuff. You know, yeah, it's not like, like not, not serious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Just don't like, come in my room. Yeah, I don't want to see my room. That, yeah, like exactly. real lame rebellious. I don't think it was yeah. like, too out there. And then she met Rod. Yeah, exactly. And then she kind of rebelled a little too. She kind of like went from zero to fifty in like mm. half a second. She would fight with her family over trivial shite. 
Uh, but when she met Rod, as you just said, they went together like pumpkin and spice. Mm, nice. They met in school in... <laughs> you like spice pumpkin I spice? I do, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me more about this. Exactly. <laughs> let's just skip this whole segment and go, go, let's talk about pumpkin spice. They met in school in Eustace and they became close friends. Um, now, Rod, he would eventually move back to Murray, Kentucky. That was when Sandra, she broke up with her fella and they all moved back. But Rod, he would keep in touch with Heather, uh, often running up large phone bills, kind of just on the phone to her all the time. Uh, and eventually her parents stopped the calls. They were like, here, listen, have I had enough of this? And that made Heather, according to her sister, very angry because she was all about talking to Rod all the time, who was a pretty cool guy. Very angry. That's that's serious. I know. Very. When a... When a Teenager says they're very angry. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty. They, they mean they're pretty. Angry. I don't think I've ever told my friends I'm no. very angry. I'm super mad at you right now. The phone bill that you racked up was like maybe like eight hundred dollars. Oh, it was regularly like 90. a couple of hundred. Yeah, yeah, back in the nineties, it was the longest like, phone call. So every month it would be a couple hundred. Like even some months it was a thousand dollars, just the phone bill. So by this stage, though, Heather was a full-on member of Rod's vampire cult. She wearing the black. Mm -hmm. She had a school bag with a hangman's noose, which is. Pretty, badass. Yes, exactly that. That's what I was... Did we go say something different? No, I was going to say pretty hardcore, but badass does. From the news, she would hang a Barbie doll. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. I actually feel like maybe I want to start doing that. Right. So far, these people sound pretty cool. Obviously, there's a point in the story when it turns, but up to that turning point, mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah, these are pretty, some pretty cool people. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I would hang out with them. You know, she'd wear pentagram shirts. I'm pretty sure I have some pentagram shirts. I think our wardrobes are probably just totally inspired by Heather Wendorf and Rod Farrell. Uh, let's move on. So, so Rod, let's go. Let's talk a little bit more about Rod and the whole depths of his vampire depravity, right? He was raised on the vampire movies we were just talking about. A vampire in Brooklyn was his favorite, I believe. Absolutely. Of course, obviously, his mother was into all sorts of like occult stuff too. So they kind of were like a match made him, and he became obsessed. He became obsessed with a role-playing tabletop game called. Vampire the Masquerade. Now, Keith, are you familiar with Vampire the Masquerade? You know what? I'm not big into, like, role-playing games. Mm -hmm. um, that's in the bedroom. No, but I'm, yeah. I'm not big into role-playing games. And I actually did research this game beforehand. Okay. And while I was reading the rules, it was one of those, you know, when you're reading. Yeah. And then you just, you've stopped listening to I yourself know. while you're reading. I, myself, I've never played it. I, I, I Wikipedia did it. I started looking through, through it. And then my eyes started to glaze over. And then I was like, oh, wait, no. I have sex. So I stopped reading. <laughs> but Rod, he did both, actually. He played and he had sex, so he's pretty cool. He's a pretty cool dude. So when he would play Vampire the Masquerade, his character that he would uh, embody, because yeah, it's role playing, his character was a vampire named Visago, mm -hmm. who was 500 years old, much like Lyle, actually, who we talked about. Maybe Lyle. they know each other. Lyle. 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 It's, uh, not, it's not a great name to us. Lyle? Well, no. Oh, Visago. I was not Lyle, but Visago. Like, yes, it is pretty cool for a vampire. But if you're going to really embody the vampiric lifestyle. What would be your vampire what? name? Keith. <laughs> no one expects Keith <laughs> to vampire. You know? <laughs> like, it, there, there, there's a murder with someone whose their blood has been drained from their body. Yeah. It's like, oh, is it going to be Visago? Yeah. Or is it going to be Keith? Keith? That's a good. Yeah, yeah that's a good. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Lestat, right? An interview to vampire. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It's obviously a vampire. That's a vampire's name. If he just changed his name every, like, hundred years to... All right, I'm Billy Bob. The most least vampiric name is Rod. That's Unfortunately, Rod. though, he loved the attention, so he would just... He wanted people to know he's a vampire, so... That was his downfall. I know. He also loved Dr Dungeons and Dragons, so a thing you'll see with Rod is he loved these games of role-playing, where he would embody, take on personas, take on characters, you know, acting almost, believing in a fantasy world, like, not in a chill way though like really getting into it uh you know all that kind of stuff so you can see where this is going to go from there when you stop seeing the difference between reality and fantasy especially when rod had crossed over rod was given the blood of a vampire uh, a guy named stephen Jaden murphy that's a made up name though isn't it Jaden? Is it? Yeah, it is. It's like a pseudonym he had well, yeah was, I'll, I'll be honest that was one of the things when i was gonna research and stuff it yeah. was like one one article I'd read, but like I was talking about Rod yeah. and Stephen, and then the next article it was talking about Basago and Jade, and I was like, who are these people? So they did this whole crossing over thing. It's exactly like you see in an Interview with the Vampire. You have to suck the vampire's blood. Got something you can suck here for you, pal. Do you want to cross over, Keith? Wink, wink. A few more So Rod and Stephen, they met playing D&D &D together. Now, Stephen, he loved vampires. His character was also a vampire, but to him it was just fun and games. 
Uh, so kind of cool. Yeah, it's pretty pretty badass. I actually seen the there was a there was a documentary done about them. It seemed like a really like genuine. Oh yeah, he's guy. see, I've yeah. seen some interviews with him too. By the way, uh, never watch anything that's not that chapter ever again. And if you bring up anything that's not that's something I haven't made, I you were getting the fuck out of it. Um, but yeah, no, exactly. He seems like a really normal, cool guy. Surprisingly normal for the shit that he was linked to. It does feel like a lot. Of, like it really is kind of the less cinematic Lost Boys. I feel yeah, the whole group where it was just they just seem like loners and misfits, outcasts, kind of looking for an identity, and they fe- like they're living in this whole. Uh, like the Bible Belt, or what, yeah, the, 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 what was it the buckle of the Bible Belt? Yeah, it was just yeah, like rebelling against the community, and they decided to go with listen to hardcore music and dress in all black. Rod would go on to become the leader of the vampire cult in school. Murray back in Kentucky, like he was into it and used this, but he really kind of took took it over when he when he was back in Murray. And you know, he would say this was something he was born to be. He was a natural born vampire lord, if you will. He said that he witnessed when he was a young, when he was five years old, he witnessed a woman being sacrificed by satanic vampires, a group calling themselves the Black Mass. That was good. That's something Rod said he's seen. He said even his grandfather was a part of Black Mass. Like Sandra, maybe she got it even from her parents who were interested in all this stuff, who were part of it, who were vampires themselves, if you can believe that. Hell yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, it does sound pretty Also, cool. like, Rod's definitely a liar. Oh, yeah. Well, the, see, the next thing I'm going to say is that he also said he was gang-raped by the same group, uh, the Black Mask group. So, I mean, I hope he's a liar because that's pretty <laughs> fucked up. Uh, uh, his group. <laughs> yeah. You're right. I think we can presume pretty much everything Rod says is bullshit. But then again, we also got to remember that his mother is a pedophile who tried to sleep with a 14-year-old boy. So, there's some... Elements of truth. Yeah, there's some elements of truth here, definitely, for sure. In flourished the truth. It's, it's very hard to, to say what's what's real. I mean, by the way, Rod, he wasn't a stupid guy. He wasn't like an idiot. He did spend hours at the library. He would read up on psychology, how, how to manipulate people, subliminal messaging. You had to charm and control them to get, you know, people to do exactly what he wanted them to do. Like this entire time, Keith, I've been using those exact same tactics on you, so. Is that why my pants are out? I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. So, the vampire clan, it was in Kentucky, and it really then started it up. The whole vampire clan started up in, in Murray, Kentucky, when he came back to uh, from Eustace as a teen, and then, you know, he soon, in a high school, he started converting others from his high school into, you know, into converting them to vampirism, right? Join him. There was poor old Scott Anderson, Rod's girlfriend, Charity Kesey, and a Dana Cooper. Now, all of his friends had difficult backgrounds and childhoods because, I mean, come on, no normal person is going to join this shit like this. <laughs> no, no well-adjusted person is going to sign up with this. Uh, they're all uh, outcasts, you know, who, who found each other through vampirism. I guess, like, they might find each other through the chess club hmm. or something less um, murdery. Um, but they would hang out, you know, literally in a run-down old building, which they called the Vampire Hotel in the woods of Kentucky. And there, they they would party, they would do drugs, they would engage in the dark arts, Keith. The dark arts. Are you hearing me right now? That's pretty sick. When's check it? Do you do late check it? Breakfast in bed. Blood in bed. <laughs> so they'd be, they'd go there. They were, they were having a great time. They were sucking. They were fucking. They were having a good old time. And when they weren't at the vampire hotel, they were in graveyards. They were in mausoleums. Rod. He was given blood. He was passing around. Mm-hmm. Of getting everybody to cross over. And they were also doing some pretty. Mother heckin, excuse my language, hard stuff, if you can believe that. And in the Vampire Hotel, it was in the ruins and like the backwoods of uh, Kentucky, you know, in those same backwoods, there was legends of real vampires. So it had like a cool, pretty rad ass atmosphere, if you ask me. Sounds spooky as shit. It was spooky as shit. Yeah, be into it. I know. I think it sounds really cool. Man, I, I swear to God, if I was in Murray, I would have been fucking first in line to join his little gang. Yeah, dude, like still, yeah. so far so good. Like I know, yeah. right? It's pretty cool. I mean, having said that, like, Rod... I could probably do it at the bloodletting, but... Uh, I could probably be convinced to do it, Would you, would you, would you, yeah? Yeah, mm, you'd, uh... Probably. You'd, you'd, you'd taste a little bit? Yeah, I'd fucking suck it dry, dude. It'd be fucking like... <laughs> give it to me. I mean, though, then again, you gotta look at Rod, who... I mean, he's kind of like a poster child for fetal alcohol syndrome. Like, he's got this, like, really long, greasy black hair... 
He did his, he did, like, if you Google him, though, you'll see some pretty sweet-ass pictures of him where he's upside down like a bat. <laughs> that, he looks pretty cool. Or, like, other pictures where he has a sword. Yep, yep. He looks badass. Can't be a good sword, man. He studies a blade. He was said to be very charismatic, although, then again, at the same time, he also studied psychology, so it's pretty easy to be charismatic if you know how people's brains work. Yeah. So they would do the crossover. Every person at the cemetery would slice three incisions into their arm, drain that blood into a cup. Then they would add a bit of water, glug glug down the gob. Now you're a vampire. Immortality, all the good stuff, you can fly, whatever, do all the cool shit. What do you think about that? Would you do? That's like classic heavy pool, man. Just watering it down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. What's well, so the hardcore shit? It's like I want to do a shot of it. It's great, like. Mm. So they were all vampires, right? They would they would suck each other's blood. Rod, he would use a razor to slash his arms, they'd feed, they'd dress them black, dyed their hair black even, they would run away from their own homes all the time, they'd stay out all night, and they would often stay with Dana Cooper, who was a member of the gang, she was a little bit older though than the rest, she had her own place, um, like the others were in high school, but she had a job in Walmart, and but she still hung out with teens, like, that's the thing, Dana seems like she's a bit old for this, mm. like the others, it's pretty cringy, yeah. although having said that, I'd still fucking join. <laughs> and Dana though, she's like a bit out of being a cringy teen who needs you know what i mean yeah yeah no I, she wasn't like an outcast anymore yeah. when you're she uh, should she should know better she should know better she should know better but then rose mom should really know better yeah exactly although she, she tried to fuck a 14 year old so i don't think she knows anything she didn't have many friends though anyway so rod kind of got her in um so yeah they would have their seances their blood rituals but they were also fierce into not keeping it to themselves they like to spread spread the wealth if you will by committing acts of vandalism mm. Uh, they would continue to, like, it would start off with just painting shit around town, and that would escalate then to killing. Like, they, they didn't just want to have their own blood, they wanted to spread the blood and get other people's blood, or other animals' blood, really. They would start to murder small animals, dogs, cats, rabbits, that kind of shit. Uh, this kind of peaked in a local animal shelter in October 1996. Uh, on the 16th of October 1996, a worker arrived at an animal shelter. And there she found, like, the doors wide open. All the dogs had been let loose. But many of the ones that were kind of found wandering and were sometimes still inside the shelter looked like they had been beaten. And then in a field across from the shelter, they found puppies that had been just mutilated. Like, sliced up, like, real fucking sick shit. And that's when, you know, word really began to spread around town about about cults and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, man, I've seen photos of, of, like, the crime scene for that. Yeah. They literally, like, not only, like, cut, like, they tore the limbs apart. Yeah, it's real fucking, like, fucked up shit. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah okay. absolutely. Like, there's no back from that. No. So when this all came out and the word of uh, cults began to spread out, the sheriff, he knew exactly. He was like, I got him already, right? It's clearly the fucking losers who hang in the backwoods uh, dress all black or getting into this ship. He was right, and- that's like you, stereotyping you works, actually, yeah. sometimes. <laughs> um, and Rod, we would be arrested on charges of burglary, trespassing, and cruelty to animals. So after I'd be out on bail, uh, and during this, though, during this entire time of, like, the autumn, the fall of 1996, Rod was still in contact with Heather. As much as he could be, as we said earlier, they would talk all the time, their phone bills would rack up into hundreds of dollars, sometimes even thousands of dollars so after their parents cut him off on the phones they would start writing letters to each other and heather for some reason started to lie to rod uh i think she was just a messed up teenager really i guess that's the only way of explaining because she would tell rod her parents were abusing her that it was really bad she was living in hell although then again she's a vampire so hell sounds pretty sweet that's true like i'd wonder as well if like heather seems like she had a somewhat normal life Mm-hmm. But she's in communication with these teenagers that are like, come from very dysfunctional homes, abusive homes, uh, a lot of drug use, alcohol use, abuse as well. And if these are the people you're associating with and they're telling these stories, you'd probably feel a bit left out. Mm-hmm. Bit, a bit, bit, bit left out. You might... Right, they're telling you stories of, oh, like uh, my dad abused me or my mom's a pedophile or this yeah. kind of shit. They, yeah. My parents abandoned me. And then you're like, well. Oh, I, should... I was abused too on, the, yeah. on, uh, on holidays. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah, she probably just wanted to seem like she was one yeah. of the. In, fit, yeah. She probably just wanted to fit in with them, absolutely. Rod, then, him reading this, what she was saying to him, he wanted to be her hero, her vampire hero, who was going to come and rescue her and take her away from this abusive home she had. They could run away and be vampires together. Even though, actually, Heather had a boyfriend and he had a girlfriend. They could still be together. Mm. All of them. She played the damsel in distress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So then, in November 1996, Rod, Charity, Rod's girlfriend, 
Scott, who's like Rod's best friend, and Dana, they all drove to Eustace in Scott's car. It was a 12-hour drive. And their mission, Operation Rescue Heather, and then move to New Orleans. They will move to New Orleans, which is the home of the vampires, the most vampiric city in America, I believe. Uh, you know, Anne Rice, she was there. She wrote Interview the Vampire. That's it there. You know, you can actually go there and like get faked vampire teeth. It's a huge thing in New Orleans. It's like what Salem is to witches, New Orleans is the vampires. Oh, like, really? legit, it's a whole culture down there. Okay. But anyway, there's a really good documentary, um, Dark Tourist. It's on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's done by this New Zealand guy. It's really, really good. But he does an episode where he goes to New Orleans and he, like, embeds himself in the whole vampire culture. Mm-hmm. It's super interesting. It's very much actually exactly like this because it's all right. a little bit sad. <laughs> 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 so they were going to go there and live together as a family and do all their, their weird shit. Um, they would go to Eustace. They would moot, meet in the spooky cemetery in downtown Eustace. Uh, Heather there that day, uh, she would cross over so officially join their clan. So she wasn't about her reporters. No, she just liked the look. Uh, and then she became uh, like a proper, because I mean the real proper vampire shit started uh, when Rod went back, back to Murray after he left Eustace and that's when the real kind of shit started. Yeah, that kind of, it all kind of really happened within like the span of a year really. Oh yeah, yeah. This yeah. was like it went from zero to 90 like real quick. Yeah. I mean they didn't waste any time. Fair yeah. play to them. So then the plan was to go to Heather to Wendorf house, Heather Wendorf's house and steal their car. Now Scott, he had his car, but they wanted another one. It was a piece of shit. Yeah, exactly. It was a piece of shit. So Rod then took some LSD uh, and himself and his right-hand man, Scotty, they went to the Wendorf home on the 25th of November. The plan was to steal their car for a trip to New Orleans and maybe steal some cash, steal some jewelry, do Bob in the back pocket. They entered the Wendorf home through the unlocked garage and there, Rod, he found a crowbar. When they ventured inside the house in the living room, Richard Wendorf, Heather's dad, he was fast asleep on the couch in the living room and... While he was sawn wood, uh, Rod beat him to death with a crowbar right there and right then beating his skull into a pulp. Pieces of the skull were found all over the room. He, uh, Scott would say he swung for the fences. It's like he was trying to hit the ball over the green monster. Like he was hitting with everything he had. And then literally moments later, Naomi, who's uh, Heather's mother, you know, probably hearing something, hearing her husband having his skull caved in she came out of the shower and she found rod and scott um now rod said the plan wasn't to killing her i mean the plan wasn't supposed to be killing anybody he just did um but then when naomi she threw a cup of hot coffee at rod he well he saw red and then he chased after her she scratched the shit out of rod and then he beat her head in also with the crowbar that kind of like went from zero to 90 again real quick. I mean, I guess you have kind of typical escalation, you know, from torturing animals to then killing humans. But um, yeah, the plan was never to kill her parents at all. Uh, it was just to steal their shit so they could escape and have their little cringy life together. Yeah, that's what he says. I guess we'll never know the truth. But when he talks later about it, he takes great relish in discussing the murders. Yeah, dude. Like the way he talks. Yeah. It's real. It's like, it's like those, uh, do you know, do you know those guts in South Park? Mm. Like he, he's deputy to percent. Yeah. Like, yeah. Per se, more than his fair share. Mm-hmm. <laughs> per se. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I've seen him and like, he, it's real kind of shock factor. Yeah. And like he's talking about like a bash he's had. Man, when you listen to his interviews, his accent is even like, he's got like a, it's like he's trying to do what a vamp, what he thinks a vampire sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I killed her. He's like, almost like a British affectation mm. or something to his voice. He sounds really bizarre. Yeah. I want to know what it is to be a vampire. It equates to the life. It equates to power. It equates to the very foundation of existence. It's the communion. It's the holy wafer on the tongue. And that is what blood is to a sanguinary vampire. Now I'm just Satan himself, so... Not that I really care. I had decided to take the uh, darker path, the evil path. I found that more exciting. If it wouldn't have been the Windorfs, at the rate I was going, it would have been somebody if not more people. He's a loser. Yeah, he sucks. So nice. uh, Richard was found with burn marks on him in the shape of a V, V for vagina. Wait, no. <laughs> no, you're right. No, I'm pretty sure I'm right, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> then, apparently, they danced around the victims while they're 
blood and skull bits were just everywhere. They stole money, they stole jewelry, and off they went into Windorf car. Uh, and uh, as I said, Heather had no clue mm. this was happening. I mean, I, I imagine her, she must have been just totally fucked. Because like you said, she probably just wanted to fit in. She was making up stories of being an abused kid. Oh yeah, I was abused too. Well, her parents were apparently just very loving parents the whole time. Uh, she just wanted to be with what she guys thought she were, you know, the cool kids. And then, um, well, yeah. This happened to him. So they all fled. They all fled Eustace, all five of them now, with Heather joining. So you got what? Rod, Scott, Dana, Charity, uh, and Heather. And then hours later, the Wendorfs were found by Heather's older sister, 17 year old Jennifer, who was just coming home from work. Quite That's a shock. scene. Yeah, exactly. That'll, uh, that'll. That'll wake you up. Yeah, and, and of course, like, she sees her parents, like, brutally, horrifically murdered, and her sister is gone, too. Yeah. Man. So the police, they quickly, pretty quickly knew who they were looking for. Uh, Jennifer, obviously, was close with her younger sister, Heather. She knew about her friends. She knew about the whole Kit Kat and Caboodle. And warrants were issued for the clan of teenagers, uh, the teenagers who were on the run in the Wendorf's 1993 Ford Explorer. They'd already dumped Scott's piece of shit along the way. And Heather only found out her parents were murdered while they were out of state by the time she learned her parents were murdered. Or like, oh yeah, guess what? Guess what we did? Can you imagine? What did you think when he came back full of blood? Yeah, I don't know. It scratches on his face as well. I don't know how they kept that from her, but... Yeah. What was that? Uh... Watch your <laughs> exactly yeah yeah oh you got a fucking cat man you gotta sort that out and we know he doesn't like cats yeah well see that's the thing as well some people she's never been, just to skip ahead i guess heather she's never been convicted of anything mm. um but some people think that's not right that maybe she should have been mm. like i guess i'm telling the story from heather's point of view that she said she only heard about out of state um there's been some doubt cast on that but we'll get to that later even her sister, Jennifer, would say, oh, she, Heather knew a lot more than what she had on. Yeah, exactly. So while they were driving, um, they needed a few dollars. I guess the books, the fun books they sold from Wendorf's, they didn't get far. So Charity, Charity Kesey, she called her grandmother. Uh, her grandmother who lived in South Dakota, asking for some uh, dollar dues to keep him going. Now, Charity's grandmother knew that she was on the run, and she did the right thing. She promptly called the police to tell them where, where they were. Then the gang, they were tricked into going into a motel in Baton Rouge, uh, where the police were waiting for them. They were arrested, like, straight up, like, four days after the murder. These stupid kids were just tricked into, oh, hey, go here. And Man. the cops were, like, immediately there. They were played like a goddamn fiddle. Um, so arrested was Rod Farrell, 16, Scott Anderson, 17, Charity PC 16, Dana Cooper 19, and Heather Wendorf 15. And Rod was a big fan of all the attention that would come afterwards. Like this quickly became a became a huge circus. Now initially though, Rod would not deny that he had done it. I mean initially he would deny that he had done it, but you know, the vampire aspect was something he definitely wanted to keep as part of it. He would say that the murders of the Wendorfs, the double homicide, had been committed by a rival gang of vampires led by Stephen Jaden uh, Murphy mm. that he had done. And they were framing Rod and his little his little groupies over here. They were the real guys, you know. And, and of course, Rod, uh, Jaden was the person who crossed Rod over into the um, whole, you know, vampire lifestyle. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Box check it. Yeah, exactly. It makes sense to me. Um, though, you know, it, it it didn't really work too long, and eventually everybody just caved in and said, "Oh yeah, we we kind of we kind of did that." Ah, box jump. Don't check it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was a swift turn around. Whoop, <laughs> my neck hurts. Actually, Rod he would later plead guilty, hoping to avoid the death penalty, and he would say though that everyone was innocent except for himself and Scott, and Scott was just an accessory. It was just him and Scott who went into the house and did the killing. Yeah. So, um, before we get to Rod's trial, though, let me say what happened to the other members of the clan. Charity got 10 years, uh, Dana got 17, Heather, she was arrested and she was charged Mm. as well, but the prosecution, they declined to press the charges, um, and even today, though, the sheriff says she should have been indicted on the charges he wanted pressed, but the district attorney never indicted her on them, so... I don't know why. I mean, it comes back to Jennifer thinking that Heather was more involved and knew what was going to happen to her parents more than, you know, she wasn't an innocent, yeah. stupid kid who made a mistake. Yeah. Some people think she was in on it. Yeah, I don't know when you're on the phone that much. 
I know. Yeah, exactly. You think plans be made? You know. You think she would have a hint by now of who she was like inviting Some over? Idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Scott's involvement, uh, it's always been a little bit shaky. Um, you know, Rod and him always said he was just merely there, but he got life in prison. And Rod Farrell went on trial in February 1998, saying the claims against him, the words he said the claims against him were humorous. That's how he, he called them. Um, That's a word. I know, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I like it. It's like, dude, you're pretty <laughs> fucking cool. Um, his defense, though, pled insanity, you know, just reason of insanity. He just went insane. Um, that didn't work. In fact, his whole pleading guilty didn't even work either because the judge sentenced him to death. And he was the youngest inmate on death row. Until, that is, late 2000s, when both him and Scott were resentenced. Scott got 40 years now, not life, and Rod got life without parole instead of death row. And that ends the tale of Rod Farrell and the vampires of Murray, Kentucky. Nice. Now, how does life work with an immortal vampire? That's a good point, right? He's, uh, life without parole is like, pff, just kind of... It's going to be there for a while. It's going to cost the taxpayer actually quite a lot. Yeah, if you think about it that way. Yeah, man. That's yeah. a lot of... Uh, it's a lot of free meals. It's a lot of bread and water. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. A lot of blood. A lot of blood, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He obviously loves the attention. Oh, I'm, man. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Surprised. Like, I feel like that probably one of the reasons as well why he... Like, it seems like this, no, like this noble thing for him. Like, mm. no, these guys had nothing to do with it. It was all me. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's me, me, me. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, like, yeah. no, no, it is me, me, me. I'm a know? bad boy. I did it all myself. Yeah, exactly. And he didn't want to give anybody else the credit. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm surprised, like, he didn't try something like, no, the execution. Because you can pick your own execution, can't you? I'm not sure. Let me let me check. And, well, because it would have been in Florida, I guess. They would have been... Uh, pick. Would be good to pick. Stick to the heart. I mean, it's Florida, so they probably would have let you fucking chop your own head off. Like, <laughs> have you ever seen a man eat his own head? Yeah, apparently individuals have the right to choose their own destiny. I thought it would lean on that a bit and go for, like, stick to the heart. Like, mm-hmm. really lean on that. Well, I think it's a, you have to choose between lethal injection or electric chair. Oh, but I not really choose. Well, then I suppose if, like, if you're doing that, you'd be like, I want to die of old age. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing. Oh, you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's a loophole. <laughs> fucker, 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 yeah. Yeah. fucker broke the system. And yeah, I guess there, unless you have any closing observations, we can finish up this podcast right here and right now. I think it was good. Yeah, yeah very, very, very interesting. I think, like, sometimes, like, some of the stuff I was reading through, some of the other stuff, uh some of your resources I was looking through, they give him a lot of credit for what, like, for what he's done. He's completely, uh, absolutely disorganized killer. Mm. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And just, it clearly comes from, like, like, yeah. obviously, like, he has, like, alcohol, substance abuse, mm. men- mentally ill, yeah. clearly, clearly, like, but he's not this organized, vampiric, supernatural being that can, like, yeah. The guy, yeah. the guy, the guy's a mess. He's a exactly, guy. yeah. He's, he's, he's failure. He's a loser. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So he deserves to be forgotten, which is why we are yeah. bringing him up again. But that's it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never, nobody else is allowed to make a podcast or video or anything else about him ever again. He's forgotten, all right? End of. The end. Yeah. Uh, all right, thank you so much for listening to this old podcast. I hope you enjoyed joining me and Keith for, for this one. Um, and yeah, please uh, rate, review, follow. It helps out the podcast tremendous, uh, tremendously and tell Tell me all your favorite things about Keith. I'm going to read them in the reviews. Um, but yeah, the next podcast will be in a couple of days, two every week. So look forward to that. But until then, take care of each other. Take care of yourselves because tell them you love them. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. Bye, <laughs> <Mike>, yeah. <laughs>